Before I turn it over uh, to Sash, who's going to kick things off, uh, I wanted to just provide a couple of quick reflections. One, um, about eight years ago, the Vermont Council on Rural Development that I currently work for convened a conversation uh, around the state of Vermont called the Council on the Future of Vermont. And they came up with a set of recommendations across policy areas about the future of the state. And I want to read one of those. This is from 2009. I want to read it uh, to you all. It, it relates to land use planning. Vermont's natural environment, working landscape, and typical pattern of development with villages and open countryside are in danger. Coordinated strategic planning at local, regional, and state levels needs to balance the needs of transportation, economic development, energy, and natural resources assessment, uh, and land use planning as a comprehensive whole. Currently, the absence of coordination among levels of planning undermines its utility and effectiveness. It is time for Vermont to advance a better coordinated regional and statewide land use strategy. So that was from 2009, uh, Council on the Future of Vermont's uh, set of recommendations. To a large degree, I think Act 174 really makes an effort at delivering on that goal in that it, so much of what that piece of legislation is about is the integration of planning at the statewide, regional, and local level. You have a comprehensive energy plan drafted every, every six years. You have now regions writing their regional energy plans and municipalities uh, writing their ener energy plans. And the idea is that there is integration at all of those levels and consistency at all of those levels. And that's really what underpins Act 174. Another really important component of this legislation is it's not just about the electric sector. Regions and towns, just like with the comprehensive energy plan, need to be thinking about thermal energy and need to be thinking about transportation. You can't just isolate one sector. You have to be addressing them holistically. And that's what Act 174 really requires, is that holistic approach uh, to energy planning and that integrated approach at the state, uh, regional, and town level. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over for much more detailed uh, presentation uh, to Sash Lewis, who is um, an attorney at Dunkill Saunders, Elliot Rob Vogel in hand, right here in Burlington, and really uh, has uh, acquired uh, significant expertise in terms of uh, proceedings before the Public Utility Commission, and particularly uh, Act 174. So let me turn it over to Sash uh, to take it from here. Good morning. So, uh, as John said, we've had enhanced energy planning in place for about a year now. Um, I would say we're still very much in a forward-looking mode. We've had some energy planning happening at the regional level and a little bit at the town level. Um, but from the perspective of a renewable energy developer, which is largely the type of folks I, re I represent, um, there are still a lot of unanswered questions, especially about what's going to happen in the Public Utility Commission when enhanced energy planning rears its head there. Uh, and that's going to be my focus on land use and renewable energy development. As John said, energy planning is a pretty comprehensive exercise, um, but my world is really in energy development. So enhanced energy planning and overview. Uh, it took effect on June 13, 2016, so we're only a year and change into it. It was enacted as part of Act 174 in the 2015-16 biennium. Uh, and the, the, the real headline, I think, for energy developers is the, is the substantial deference standard that is embedded in, uh, in the new statute. The Public Utility Commission now has to give substantial deference to land conservation measures and policies in approved energy plans at the municipal and regional levels. Uh, this is a big change from the current status quo, which is due, uh, due consideration. Um, a very, very quick nutshell of the nuts and bolts is that the Department of Public Service issues determinations of energy compliance to regional planning commissions. 
the regional planning commissions, when they have their determinations, uh, then issue determinations in turn to the, at the town level. Uh, until mid-2018, towns can go straight to the Department of Public Service for a determination of energy compliance. Um, and I just want to make clear, uh, in response to prompting from John earlier, uh, very astute, um, even until then, when a regional planning commission has a determination, the towns can then go to them rather than the, to the department. So energy plans are uh, approved or disapproved by the Department of Public Service and regions based on energy planning standards that are contained in the Comprehensive Energy Plan, the, the statewide energy plan for Vermont. Um, in a nutshell, they have to be consistent with all of the greenhouse, renewable efficiency, and energy policy goals of the state. And they also have to include an energy element, which is a pretty deep dive into uh, all of the sectors that have some bearing on energy, so transportation, uh, thermal, fuel switching, renewable, has to have specific targets for 20, 20, uh, 25, 35, and 50 pathways to get there. Um, and the, uh, my focus is the last piece, the mapping and identification of suitable and unsuitable areas for energy siting. Although as we're gonna see, um, and one of the things that I wanna highlight throughout this is that uh, the regions and the towns are really taking on pretty substantial energy policy questions um, that go a bit beyond merely identifying pieces of land that are preferred or not preferred for energy siting. And that I think is gonna be very important for anyone who's interested in this sector. So the status quo, due consideration. This is the standard that currently governs the Public Utility Commission's review of regional recommendations and municipal plans when you're trying to get a certificate of public good for a renewable energy project. Um, it is, it's not a very well-defined standard. We know that it is advisory rather than controlling, um, and that's, that is pretty much the most accurate description of it. I, I was a big fan of what Justice Robinson said about it in the Rutland Renewable case in her concurrence. She said, uh, due consideration is reminiscent of the phrase with all due respect, which invariably precedes and qualifies a statement evincing little to no respect at all. Uh, I don't know that I would characterize the PUC's treatment of municipal and regional recommendations as, as that disrespectful, but certainly to someone who's reading the statute, uh, it's hard to get better guidance than that. The substantial deference standard is a big switch from that. I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph, but I've highlighted the provisions that I think uh, raise the greatest questions about the world that we're currently living in under Act 174. So rather than merely looking to land conservation policies and recommendations, uh, the PUC is now going to be considering specific policies in energy plans, in, in regional and municipal plans. Um, uh, it's going to be considering regional and municipal plans, whereas at the, uh, at the moment, all that's considered are regional recommendations and town plans. Uh, so that's a big step up for the RPCs in terms of their voice at the Public Utility Commission. This is mandatory. It's going to be applied uh, by the Public Utility Commission according to its terms. That's not optional. Uh, unless the petitioner can show by clear and convincing evidence uh, that other factors outweigh the application of, of these provisions. These raise big questions. Currently, the Public Utility Commission, I think it's fair to say, applies what you might call a preponderance of the evidence standard in CPG proceedings, um, which is to say, if you can show that it's more likely than not that you don't have an undue adverse impact or that you're producing some economic good, um, you'll get your permit. Uh, clear and convincing is, is a big increase in the burden on petitioners when they're faced with this situation. The other question is other factors. That's not defined here. Um, if it refers exclusively to the Section 248 criteria, I think it's fair to say that the focus is going to be on need for power and economic good, which are the only affirmative standards in Section 248. But it's not known, and so I think that is an area that is gonna be pretty interesting to watch when decisions start coming out. Trends so far. So as, uh, as John pointed out, we're about a year in. The department has approved three regional plans, uh, most recently two rivers out of Quichi, which was just, uh, just Thursday, actually. They've denied one plan from the town of New Haven. 
Um, these are interesting reading. The, the affirmative decisions approving these energy plans uh, are fairly formulaic. They don't provide a great deal of guidance. They, they provide some general observations on um, how enhanced energy planning works and what the department is looking for. The denial of the new town of New Haven uh, is a little bit more discursive, although the denial was on grounds that were fairly technical, having to do with shortfalls in the town of New Haven's mapping exercises. Um, that's, that's an interesting thing to observe because the town of New Haven, as we'll see, uh, made some pretty aggressive claims about what is required in terms of its energy policy that I think the department punted a little bit. So one of the trends that I see coming out uh, that uh, underscores what I said earlier about regions and towns wading into substantive energy areas is the idea of fair share. The town of New Haven's uh, plan, it made a lot of its mapping decisions based on the idea that uh, generation in the town that has been cited in the town of New Haven exceeds the demand of the town of New Haven and its distribution lines are at capacity. Um, and on that ground, essentially said, well, we don't, we don't need to engage in some of these mapping exercises. Um, the concept of fair share has also popped up in a couple of the regional plans that have been approved by the Department of Public Service. The NRPC highlighted a concern that some of its southern and western areas uh, might have more, gener more generation than it has demand, and also highlighted the, the fact that it could find itself being an energy exporter to Chittenden County and um, raised a question about the fairness of that. Similarly, in Bennington, uh, there's a provision saying that wind should be limited so it's not out of proportion with the energy demands of the region. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, I think, sets up a really interesting question of whether the Public Utility Commission, some point down the line, is going to be applying the substantial deference standard and considering whether it is a specific policy to say, we're contributing enough and we don't need any more energy cited in our town, uh, or whether that is something that the Public Utility Commission is going to treat uh, more aspirationally. Um, but it is definitely a trend that I see emerging in a few of the plans uh, that have come out so far. Another one that I see is treatment of wind. Uh, Bennington's regional plan has a thousand meter buffer around residential structures for wind turbines greater than a megawatt. To me, the significance of that is that it, it wades into uh, a question about wind siting that previously only the Public Utility Commission has really addressed. Um, for example, the Public Utility Commission has a, has a sound rule that I think is being discussed in one of the sessions today uh, that has a setback, but only for wind projects over 150 kW. Um, and it's, it's a smaller setback than I think Bennington is requiring. And so I think this, this presents sort of a vision where regions and towns could have uh, dimensional and substantive requirements that uh, are fairly detailed and granular and, and that developers need to pay a great deal of attention to. Similarly, the NRPC uh, has, has a statement that uh, any wind facility with a tower over 100 feet tall is industrial or commercial. Uh, and I think Catherine can explain more about that. Um, that's an interesting determination as well. I mean, there, there are plenty of, of 10 or 25 kilowatt wind facilities, which are basically single home facilities that could easily have a tower height of 100 feet. Um, and so again, I, I see enhanced energy planning producing um, not just land use questions for developers, but also energy policy questions that I think people need to be paying very careful attention to and participating in at every level. So that brings me to strategies and recommendations. Um, in a nutshell, I think anyone who wants to advocate for renewable de development to, uh, to continue at something like the pace we've seen uh, is to participate early and often at every level of enhanced energy planning. Um, there are a few reasons for this. I, I have, this is a little bit technical, but I think the constraints under which um, advocates are going to operate in the enhanced energy planning world are important to bear in mind when you think about how to have some impact on the process. So first of all, as the department has pointed out, um, a, a, de a determination of energy compliance is an up or down vote. There is no partial or provisional approval or rejection of an energy plan. It's, it's either a yes or a no, and the whole thing goes in or goes out. 
only regional planning commissions in towns can appeal a determination of energy compliance. So if you are someone who thinks that, um, that the land use or other provisions in your region or, or town's energy plan are overly restrictive, you have to participate before it is adopted because once it's adopted, you don't have a mechanism for appeal. Only the regions and towns have that mechanism available to them. Interestingly, appeals are going to the Natural Resources Board, which oversees Act 250, rather than the Public Utility Commission. Um, and so, and as, as the slide says at the bottom, the PUC is actually statutorily barred from considering whether or not a determination of energy compliance should have been issued. Uh, and so there's, there's an effect under Act 174 of, of um, really shoring up and under, underpinning the power that has been granted at the regional and municipal levels and sheltering it from appeals. Um, I think reasonable people can debate whether or not that's a proper mechanism, but I think the, the message for everybody is if you want a say in the process, you need to do it early before it gets to that point. So that brings me to strategies for participation. I think for developers, um, the easiest strategy is choose prime sites. I guess that's not really a participation strategy, it's an avoidance strategy, but sometimes discretion is a better part of valor. Uh, if, if you do not have the appetite or the interest in impact litigation of the Public Utility Commission, I think very few developers do, I think it's very incumbent upon you to choose a site that's been identified as preferred or prime that is not subject to policies or land conservation measures that would uh, lead to a denial at the Public Utility Commission level. Again, get involved early. Uh, I probably, if I had had time, I probably should have had a whole slide on towns as a policy trend because the regional planning commissions are issuing mapping of land based largely on data sets from ANR and other sources, um, just showing the, the fundamental data set constraints on pieces of land. But towns are going to be engaged in a really comprehensive exercise of picking view sheds and historical districts and areas in their towns where they do and do not want energy to be cited um, or considerations that they want to go into the design of projects. Uh, and so I think developers have had the luxury to date of relying on the exemption from zoning in Act 250 for energy, but that's no longer the case. And I, so I think people who are interested, whether they're energy advocates or people who have a piece of land they want to develop or developers who are thinking about a place, uh, need to be talking to the towns and the regions. Um, keep an eye on expiration dates. If you're not happy with your energy plan, it will expire uh, every eight years, I believe, as will regional and town plans. Uh, the comprehensive energy plan is also an area where you can get involved. That also expires, and, and I think the department is, is relatively transparent about developing it. Um, and you can always contact your representatives. I think the, as I'll go into on my next slide, the department has highlighted some legislative changes it would like to see, and I, I think there's a sense that Act 174 might see some tweaks. Um, and so folks who want to see the policy go in a different direction should be keeping an eye on that. The legislative changes that DPS has advocated so far in its Town of New Haven determination are four conditional or provisional uh, determinations of energy compliance. Um, I think the fact that enhanced energy planning is such a broad-based multi-sector exercise um, is good cause to want some kind of partial approval mechanism because the, the things that led the department to deny the town of New Haven largely had to do with mapping and land use, but it didn't really have critiques of the multi-sector analysis that New Haven did. Uh, Second of all, DPS wants a waiver mechanism for specific standards uh, along similar lines. Personally, I would like to see a more balanced appeal process. Um, I can understand why uh, the legislature would not want people be able to hold up energy plans on technicalities about thermal conservation targets. Uh, but some of the land use thing, uh, land use provisions of Act 174, I think are a little out of balance with how land use uh, is done in Act 250 and in zoning. And with the energy component, uh, I think it's worth having some mechanism uh, for people who are impacted by energy planning to, to have recourse. And along similar lines, I, was, uh, I find it a bit of a head scratcher that the, that the PUC is, is out of the appeals mechanism given its, its deep bench of energy policy experts. 
uh, finally, this, this is just um, to underscore my, my thoughts about the legislative process. Uh, as you can see from data about other states in New England, Vermont has uh, the most aggressive energy goals in New England, uh, if not the country, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and so I think that uh, the achievability of those goals is something that uh, people need to keep a close eye on. And enhanced energy planning definitely has a lot of bearing on it. Uh, and so I think there's going to be a lot of conversation at every level about how to get to those goals within the current constraints. Um, finally, I was asked to tie everything back to the theme of the conference, which is renewables for all. I think if it's going to be renewables for all, uh, it's going to have to be renewable energy policy for all uh, because of the new weight that towns and regions have in all of these decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sash. So uh, when you agree to moderate a panel like this, the fun thing is you sort of, uh, you get to do some introductions. Catherine Dimitrik, and I didn't realize this, she has served as the director of the Northwest Regional Planning Commission uh, for over 20 years now. That's quite a tenure. I don't think there's too many RPC directors who have served for that length. That's, that is a testament to her ability uh, to really work uh, with her member towns and various constituencies uh, up there in, in northwestern Vermont. So uh, let me bring Catherine up and let me try to find her PowerPoint here. And there we go. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. It was a great overview of Act 174 and how it fits in the picture of overall renewable energy development in the state. What I'm going to talk about is the Northwest Regional Plan in particular. And the reason why I'm going to go through our plan is because of Act 174 and the way the standards are set up, the way our plan is designed is very similar to how all of the regional plans in the state and many of the local plans will be designed. So by giving you an overview of what's in our plan, it will give you a flavor of what you'll see in the other regional plans and in town plans across the state. So our plan was just given energy com uh, determination of energy compliance in, in uh, September 19th. And that was the culmination of a very long process. We took two years to develop our regional energy plan. We were one of the first three regions in the state to begin this process. We had a series of over 20 public meetings through the process as well as countless other conversations and opportunities for input. Within our regional plan, we have several sections dealing with regional energy use, energy targets, our goals and policies and implementation or pathways as they're sometimes called, and our implementation challenges. For our regional plan, we adopted the whole plan as an appendix to our regional plan that addresses housing and education and utilities and all of the other areas. And then we also put a summary within our regional plan. And what's important to note is under Act 174, it's not just the energy sections or the energy plan that gets reviewed, it's the entirety of the plan. So it's really important as you develop these plans that they are compatible with your other land use sections, with your economic development sections, et cetera. And we'll talk about how that comes into play a little bit with this wind decision that Sash noted. So when you look at regional energy use, I'm going to focus on two areas. One is space heating and one is the other one is transportation. Our current energy use right now is really focused on fossil fuels. If you look at the breakdown, fuel, oil, and kerosene and uh, is, is really our largest space heating source. Over time, we expect to see that change, but this is a snapshot of our current situation. And in transportation, our region actually has some of the highest commuting distances. It's greater than the average in both the state and in the nation. And that comes into play not only from an energy perspective, but also from this affordability question that we look at. Uh, in our region, there's only one census track in all of Franklin and Grand Isle counties where transportation costs are less than 15% of a household income. And that's kind of a standard for affordable transportation costs. And that's in St. Albans City. For the remainder of our region, transportation costs exceed 15% of household income. So that dove plays in, in with the energy concerns when we're looking at overall community health in our region. 
so now we we'll look at where our energy comes from and where we have what renewable energy we currently have in our region. Currently, we have a total of about 98 megawatts of generation capacity. But of that, it's important to note that 40 megawatts is really an on-demand peak plant that only operates as needed. So if you take that out, it's definitely less than the 98 megawatts. We also have proposed but not built an additional 75 megawatts. And in that, um, in the wind, is the Swanton Wind Project, which you've probably seen uh, um, and know about. And in the solar projects, that includes two very large potential 20 megawatt uh, projects in the region. And I say very large, not as a judgment, but as just a description. So then we, we look at our regional energy targets. Overall, there's a lot going on in this slide, but what's important for you to note is that if, as, as the bars move over to the right, the black and white hash marks, is this shows the energy that we're not going to use, that we're going to avoid through efficiency and conservation. So even as our population and our commerce grows over time, the amount of total energy we use is going to decline. The red bar at the top is electricity. So you can see even as our, our overall energy declines, the amount that we use in electricity grows. And the green bars at the bottom are more renewable sources, and their share of total energy also grows. These projections were developed uh, in cooperation with um, VEIC. And it uh, was a great partnership with them and the Department of Public Service to develop these projections. When you look at space heating, where we looked earlier, uh, at the sources being largely uh, fossil fuels. If you look here, our projection over time, again, electricity is in the top. We expect electricity to become a much greater share of our space heating needs over time, and we expect our renewables to grow slightly, but not as much. And then finally, looking at transportation. This, this to me, as a practitioner, is uh, the area that is where we see quite an amazing transformation expected for two reasons. One is efficiency, and the second is the switch to an electric vehicle fleet. So you can see, again, electricity is the red box at the top. We expect that to have a greater share of our transportation energy, and we expect our total energy in transportation to decrease substantially. And now in terms of where our energy comes from, we expect that our fossil fuel sources for electricity will continue to decrease, and our renewable, looking at hydro, solar, and wind, will increase by 2050. So how are we going to get there? This is what people really often care about in our regional energy plan, is how do we project we're going to get there? So we, using the 90 by 50 goal, using the projections, looking at our overall land use capabilities in the region, and the different projections available to us, high solar, low wind, low solar, high wind, and anywhere in between, we came up with uh, these projections for a cumulative, these are cumulative total, so a cumulative total of, new, of 19 new megawatts of wind by 2050, 10 new megawatts of hydro by 2050, and 208 new megawatts of solar by 2050. And for folks who are looking at this for the first time, we found that hearing 208 new megawatts of solar is quite a large number and can be a little overwhelming. So this graphic at the, at the right, we found to be quite helpful. The large green circle is the total land area in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. The smaller light green circle is the amount of land in our region that's shown to be good for solar development because of aspect or slope or number of other factors. And then the little tiny dot within that light green is the amount of that land that would need to be developed in order to achieve our 208 megawatts of new solar. So sometimes the numbers can seem big, but we found that if you can demonstrate how it actually fits into the overall landscape, it's been very helpful. So goals, policies, and implementation, I'm only going to focus on one area here, um, and that's this one, this renewable energy goal that we just talked about, looking at 19 new megawatts of wind in particular. So in our region, we've determined that the way we are going to accomplish the 19 new megawatts of wind is to have small-scale wind only. And I'll tell you how that fits into the standards and how we got there. So 
within Act 174, there's one standard, standard 12A, that basically says if you're going to say a particular scale or type of renewable energy is not suitable in your town or your region, you have to have that same qualification for other developments of similar types. So you can't say um, no new solar in this part of town, but strip malls are fine. You know, so you've got to really be balanced in your approach and treat renewable energy like you do other forms of land use and land development. So what was interesting in how we arrived at this, to me, was that we had a, we had a really wonderful energy committee that was very open-minded going into this. And they were not a group that had a decision and tried to justify how to get there. They were a group that was very deliberative and looking at the data and ended up at this conclusion after a full examination of the facts and the information. So this map um, extends beyond the northwest region. The areas to the right are in uh, Lamoille and Orleans County. But if you look at this map, what I'll tell you is that the purple areas are areas where prime wind exists. And prime wind is defined as areas where there is high capacity for wind development and where there are no known resource constraints. So there's no known endangered species, flood plains, et cetera, those regulatory constraints that would prevent development. And when you look at this, if you focus on the area that's our region, which ends at Richford and Enosburg and Montgomery, you'll see there's actually not a lot of places that are purple. There are actually very few places that are purple. And so if you can focus your eyes on that a little bit, I'm going to show you the next map. This is our proposed land use map in our regional plan. This is consistent with the proposed land use map that we've had in our regional plan before we did our energy planning. And you will see that all of the areas that are purple on that prime wind map are dark green here. And dark green are all those areas that have been designated for conservation. And that is for a variety of reasons, habitat blocks, forest fragmentation, river corridors, scenic view sheds identified by municipalities or the region, many reasons that went into that. But if you look at consistency and how in our regional plan we treat development, the, the conclusion that our commission came to was that to be consistent and to treat renewable energy the same as we did other land development, that only small scale wind would be appropriate in our region. We do have in the the plan, some, language, some really strong affirmative language that says as towns do their in-depth planning, if they are to locate places that they think are the, our preferred locations for larger scale wind, then we would examine amending our regional plan to reflect that. But we did not think based on this map compared to this map that we could affirmatively say there are positive places in our region that we want to say yes. Um, large-scale wind is appropriate here. So we're the, th the first region to go through this process of, of actually saying a particular class or type of renewable energy is not appropriate in our region. The department's decision verified that um, they believed that we did use a deliberative process to come to this that wasn't singling out any particular type or scale of development. And in, this is a quote from their decision that gets to that. So that's our regional plan in a nutshell. Finally, I want to just touch briefly on what we're doing to work with municipalities. So Act 174, in its wisdom, I think, included funding for regional planning commissions to help municipalities develop their local plans. So regional planning commissions Last year, we're working with 45 municipalities to begin the process of updating their local plans to meet the standards of Act 174. And we'll be working with another 45 to 55 municipalities starting now. Um, I have some lists of those that I brought with me. If you'd like to know if your town is among those, that's going to be or already is working on an energy plan update. And I'll, I'll leave those here. And we'll also put it up on the regional planning website, which is vapda.org, V-A-P-D-A.org. So we'll make sure that's available to everybody. And um, that's it. Thank you. So um, 
Believe it or not, this confirms the fear I had about this session, which is we are, in theory, out of time. I think we're going to use a couple more minutes here uh, for some questions. And also, let me just mention, you all have evaluation sheets, little blue sheets of paper on your table. Please fill those out. Those are very helpful to the conference planners. And just leave them on your table after you do so. Let me ask a quick question that I think uh, is an appropriate follow-up at this point, which is, both of you talked about getting involved. I think uh, Sash in particular talked about the importance of, importance of getting involved in this process before a plan is improved, uh, approved given the way the appeals process is structured. Both of you be specific about how that involvement happens both at the town and regional level. Is it about submitting written comments? Is it about going to a public hearing? Or is it about potentially serving on this energy committee that you mentioned, Catherine? So I want both of you to really be a little more specific with folks about how to actually have your voice heard in this planning process. Thanks. Um, well, is this thing on? Um, as, as a legal matter, there are public hearings held um, before the adoption of a regional or municipal plan and also public hearings held by the Department of Service, Public Service before a regional plan is approved. So those are the most obvious opportunities. Um, obviously, sometimes public hearings are, are too late because sometimes you're commenting on something that's already taken some shape. Um, and so I, I think it's a wise suggestion to serve on an energy committee and get in touch with folks who, who are serving. I think Catherine is probably better positioned to speak to that. Yeah, I think that that is, is definitely right. Just as uh, energy developers don't like folks showing up at the last minute to oppose a project that they've been working on for years. We as planners like it if you participate early and often. And the way to find out and to get involved is to be in touch with your, your local town clerk if you don't know who the planning commission is or to contact your regional planning commission and find out the best way to get involved. And I also would say the same thing goes for developers. If you're thinking about a project, even if it's in the earliest stage that you feel comfortable talking about your project, that is the time to come and talk to the Regional Planning Commission on an informal basis. And we can tell you what we think our regional plan says about your potential project. And the same will go for municipalities as they begin to have their plans be approved by the department. Barry, go for it. Built, built in high school, middle school, and also the Siskoi. And I think it's often missed in, as everybody's driving for electricity, that thermal heat with wood chips or pellets is, is something that needs to be included in, in towns. There are a number of facilities in the Northwest, there's other parts of the state uh, that are good candidates. <coughs> so it would be helpful if, through the regional planning that that's improved. Yes, it is in our plan. And the quick overview, there's lots of great nuggets like that I didn't get a chance to highlight on. Thank you for bringing that up. Any other quick last questions? I see Senator McCormick in uh, the middle there. I can usually do without that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, could Catherine speak to the conventional wisdom, at least as I understand it, that small scale wind is not nearly as efficient as large scale. Because I, I, at the times when I've suggested small scale, that, that would be less aesthetically offensive and so on. And people say, well, it just doesn't be. Could you speak yeah. to that? Yeah, and, and we, we definitely heard that, and that was one of our considerations. But what we kept coming back to is this is a plan and a projection to get us to 2050. That's more than 30 years from now. Look back 30 years and think of where our technology, where our efficiency was. We have great faith in everyone who's working to make all of our renewable energy sources more efficient, more effective. And so we are really looking for technology and efficiency to help solve that problem. And to close it out, David, with the last question here. Uh, being a wind person for the last uh, 40 years, the idea that small wind works, no. It does not work. It will never work. Large, large wind is the only technology that gets into the wind stream. Wind blows way up high. You already limit it to 100 feet. There's no wind at 100 feet. It's up two or 300 feet in the air. So your projection is just saying no wind in your area. 
And that's, that's reality. I don't care how optimistic you are about 2050. It's not going to work. Good question. All right, anything? Uh, let me give uh, either, do either of you two have any closing thoughts? I'll, I'll just say um, that if the interest in this room is is any indication of people who are interested in participating in local and regional energy planning. I think we have a great future of collaboration, and I encourage you all to be active. Um, I'm gonna, I, I have a technicality I left out. I'm going to be like a lawyer. I'm going to end on a technicality. I do want to say uh, <laughs> that uh, it, even, even if your energy plan has something that you're not totally happy with as a developer, you don't have to totally give up hope because regions and plans can still make uh, recommendations to the Public Utility Commission. So in addition to saying get involved early and often, I guess the other part of that is, is keep talking throughout the process because there are, there are multiple opportunities to get a, a positive weigh-in from the planners. And, uh, and just a final closing thought for me, you know, as, as Catherine and I were talking a little bit in advance of this session, she mentioned the possibility that as towns develop their plans, they actually may reopen and amend the regional plan to more uh, to ensure consistency with those town plans. So that indicates sort of the cyclical nature of this and the and the sort of both top down and bottom up nature of this planning process. But in my mind, that highlights uh, again the potential and importance of really paying attention and staying involved as these conversations move uh, to the municipal level and as towns really roll up their sleeves and start putting these plans together. Uh, we'll be around, I think, for, uh, for other sort of questions in the hallway, so really appreciate everyone coming out today, and uh, thanks so much.